Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and literature. I'm Jennifer Ebling, and today is June 6th. Today in garden history, it was on this day, June 6th in 1648, that Elias Ashmole, the English antiquary, politician, astrologer, and alchemist, wrote in his diary that he was trying something new. He wrote, at about three o'clock, it was the first time I ever went a sampling. Dr. Carter of Reading and Mr. Watling, an apothecary there, accompanying me. Well, to go a sampling was an early term for botanizing. In the 1600s, people would gather simples, which was another word for medicinal plants. And this is why on this day, Elias Ashmole went out with a doctor, Dr. Carter, and an apothecary, Mr. Watling. And they were no doubt, the three of them, all looking for herbal remedies. And it was during the entire month of June in 1816 in New England that six inches of snow fell. In fact, the entire year of 1816 was very cold, and every month throughout that year had at least one hard frost. And temperatures dropped to lows of 40 degrees in July and August as far south as Connecticut. And so 1816 became known as the year without a summer in New England. Well, the weather anomalies of 1816 actually originated from the volcanic eruption of Mount Tambora the previous year. And it turns out that this event at Mount Tambora became the largest volcanic explosion in recorded history. And Mount Tambora spewed small particles that were light enough to spread over the atmosphere during the following year in 1816. And the overall impact on the world's climate was profound. The temperature of the Earth dropped an average of three degrees Celsius across the globe. But on the bright side, the terrible summer of 1816 served as an inspiration to many writers. In Lake Geneva, Switzerland, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein while on a vacation with her husband, the poet Percy Bysshe Shelley, and their friend, the poet Lord Byron. Well, there was a point in this vacation when the three writers had been stuck inside for days thanks to nonstop rain and gray skies. And so, while Mary was writing Frankenstein, Lord Byron wrote his poem called Darkness, and it begins with these words. I had a dream which was not at all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished. And it was on this day, June 6th in 1864, that the popular American writer and political reporter John Beauchamp Jones wrote these words in his journal. Clear and hot, but with a fine breeze southwest. Yesterday I learned both sides buried the dead. What a war, and for what? John then wrote about some updates from the battlefield before writing about his garden. He wrote, Small heads of early York cabbage sold in market today at $3 or $5 for two. At that rate, I got about $10 worth out of my own garden. Mine are excellent and so far abundant, as well as the lettuce, which we have every day. My snap beans and beets will soon come on. The little garden is a treasure. And I bet it was. John Beauchamp Jones was born in Maryland, and he served as a Confederate soldier during the Civil War. 
And today is National Garden Exercise Day. Today is a day for gardeners. Gardening is a workout. I don't need to tell you that. But it's also therapeutic on so many levels. So you have the physical aspect of gardening, which is quite demanding and is an excellent way to build muscle and burn calories. But then there are benefits to your brain and your emotional health. And if you listen to podcasts while you garden, well, then you're also learning and growing at the same time. You're learning about new plants and techniques or just general garden information at the same time that you're out in the garden, taking in information through all your senses. And so today is a day for gardeners. And today and every day in your garden, make sure to stay hydrated and make a point of gardening in a way that promotes good health for you. Take breaks, stretch, use garden chairs, add elevated beds, add hammocks while you're at it, whatever you need to create a place of rest in your garden so that you do have a place where you can sit down and take a load off. Be careful lifting those heavy items. And when you're stocking your garden tote, make sure to tuck in some Band-Aids, some bee sting relief, maybe an EpiPen or some Benadryl, and some Betadine. Recently, I have bought, I think, three or four bottles of Betadine, and I made sure to tuck one in my garden tote. And I've already used it twice this year. Once when I had a little accident with a tree stump, and then I just had another rose thorn injury and I was really happy to have that betadine on hand because you never know when you might need a little first aid in the garden. So anyway, happy National Garden Exercise Day. I hope you get to take full advantage. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Sibley Guide to Trees by David Allen Sibley. Well, this book came out in 2009, but when it comes to tree reference books, this is one of the best. This book has over 500 five-star reviews on Amazon, and it's easy to see why. This book is laid out in such an accessible way. It's very easy to use. I keep one tucked in my garden bench in the garage because I love keeping this guide handy. And I should mention that the reason it's called The Sibley Guide to Trees is because it's written by David Allen Sibley. And if that name's familiar, it's because he is the bird guide author and illustrator. And so you have those side-by-side skills of bird identification and tree identification, and they just go together. And so you've got David Sibley applying kind of the same approach that he used with birds for the equally complex subject of tree identification. And if trees are a challenge for you, well then you will definitely appreciate the over 4,000 illustrations that are in this guide. And I had to chuckle just a little bit, I wanted to share with you, Amazon did a quick Q&A with David Allen Sibley about this book, and they asked him, what were the major differences in writing this book versus The Guide to Birds? And I got a kick out of David's answer. He said, the obvious difference is that trees are much easier to find. When I needed to study a particular species of tree, I could just walk right up to it and spend as much time investigating it as I needed. Birds are more elusive. I had to spend years in the field in order to build up enough observation time to draw them well. And I thought David's response was such a clue to the rest of us when it comes to tree identification, because David spends time with trees. And I can't tell you how many people I have helped over the years identify a tree after they spent one or two seconds looking at a single leaf, and that was it. And trees can offer us so many more clues. And this leads to another question that Amazon asked David, which was, what would you say to someone who is a beginner at tree identification? And David said, the first thing I would suggest 
is to spend some time with my guide. Try to become familiar with the characteristics of certain trees, then go through the book and mark all the species that occur in your area. This will help you become familiar with the range of species that could be present. So when you see an odd leaf shape or flower or fruit or bark pattern, even if you can't remember the name, you can remember seeing it in the guide. And since trees are so easy to approach, you can simply take a photo of the key parts of any tree or pick up a leaf or other part that has fallen on the ground and identify it at your leisure. The key identifiers will always be the shape, color, and size of leaves, the color and shape of twigs, the color and texture of bark, and the tree's overall size and shape, as well as habitat, any fruit or flowers, and the timing of seasonal changes. For example, in late May in the Northeast, if you see a pale barked tree with small silvery leaves just emerging while other trees have well-developed green leaves, you can be virtually certain that it is a big tooth aspen. While a multi-trunked spreading tree in wet soils with clusters of straw-colored fruit hanging from the twigs all winter is most certainly a female box elder. So a couple of great examples there from David on tree identification. Some great tips to keep in mind. It's more than just looking at a single leaf. Take your time, look at all different aspects of the tree, and definitely take tons of pictures. And now with the iPhone, you can take a picture of any plant or any part of a plant, any leaf, and then press the little info icon. And then it will ask you right there if you want help with plant identification. And that particular part of the Photos app for me has been especially helpful. And I have to say, surprisingly accurate. So be sure to give that a try if you haven't yet. Anyway, this book is 426 pages of tree identification, highlighting over 600 tree species. You can get a copy of The Sibley Guide to Trees by David Allen Sibley and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $17. And it's one of my favorite guides. All right, we end the show today celebrating the birthday of Maxine Cuman, the American Pulitzer Prize winning poet, novelist, children's author, and gardener. And she was born on this day, June 6th in 1925. Maxine often incorporated garden themes into her work. In her poem called History Lesson, where she talks about letting go of the past, she wrote these garden-inspired words. That a man may be free of his ghosts, he must return to them like a garden. He must put his hands into the sweet rot, uprooting the turnips, washing them, tying them into bundles, and shouldering the whole load to market. And any gardener who has battled a woodchuck will appreciate Maxine's poem, Woodchucks. This poem was written after Maxine herself had to do battle with a family of woodchucks that had invaded her vegetable garden. Now, in this poem, Maxine examines how everyday people can find themselves in a murderous mindset. Here's a little excerpt from Woodchucks. Gassing the woodchucks didn't turn out right. The knockout bomb from the feed and grain exchange was featured as merciful, quick at the bone, and the case we had against them was airtight. Both exits shoehorned shut with pudding stone, but they had a sub-sub basement out of range. Next morning, they turned up again, no worse for the cyanide, nipping the broccoli shoots, beheading the carrots. The food from our mouths, I said, righteously thrilling to the feel of the 22, the bullets' neat noses. I, a lapsed pacifist fallen from grace, now drew a bead on the little woodchuck's face. He died down in the ever-bearing roses. Well, in July of 1998, Maxine was gravely injured when her horse bolted. 
To the surprise of her doctors, Maxine managed to survive the ordeal, and she wrote a book about the time that she spent inside a halo, which kept her head immobilized as she endured weeks of recovery and rehab. Her 2001 book called Inside the Halo and Beyond, The Anatomy of Recovery, shared how Maxine drew strength from stories of her garden. She wrote, Keeping the garden going becomes, for the family, a way of keeping me going. Every morning, Judith climbs the hill above the farmhouse to where my fenced garden is situated just below the pond. Everything here is grown organically. The plants thrive in a soil heavily amended with rotted horse manure and are mulched with spoiled hay. The walkways are papered with old grain bags and then covered with pine needles. It has taken years to achieve this orderly chaos, which somehow compensates for my disorderly desk drawers and the chaos of my closet. In my suburban past, I had only a few self-seeding petunias and cosmos to deal with. The yard was shady, dandelions dotted the grass, and to my indifferent eye, it looked adequately tidy. But when we acquired the farm, I gradually began to see another landscape entirely. Wild asparagus appeared, waving their ferny fronds in unexpected places. In a small sunny clearing, rhubarb emerged. Garlic chives sent up little white blossoms along the house foundation, and great unkillable clumps of chives with fat purple blooms ran rampant around them. Clusters of what resembled sunflowers proved to be edible Jerusalem artichokes, and the first time Victor mowed the area that we were slowly restoring to lawn, the wonderful pungency of fresh thyme arose from the nubbly grass. This season, it is Judith who daily inspects my seven 30-foot-long raised beds for insect depredation. Whatever needs picking, Broccoli, cauliflower, early green beans, lettuce, radishes, the last of the peas, she takes down to the house to be dealt with. The surplus is blanched and frozen for the winter ahead. The tomatoes are not quite ready. The corn, cucumbers, and summer squashes are still ripening, but soon there will be that gratifying mountain of veggies. The benevolent tyranny I always try to stay abreast of, pickling, canning, and freezing. A poem of mine, in praise of gardens, ends with these words. O children, my wayward jungly dears, you are all to be celebrated, plucked, transplanted, tilled under, resurrected here. Even the lowly despised purslane, chickweed, burdock poke, wild poppies, for all of you, whether eaten or extirpated, I plan to spend the rest of my life on my knees. Maxine died in February of 2014 at the age of 88. Well, that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening to The Daily Gardener. And just a reminder that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the Buy Me a Coffee link over at the website or in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Every day.